Hello there. We are again back with a GMAT topic and that is quant quotient types and tricks. So first of all, we're going to go and discuss about the quant quotient types. If you already know them, directly skip the video to the tricks. And I assure you, you're going to be a happy man after seeing the video. You'll be able to do the questions in under one minute of time. So talking about the quantitative section first. It comprises of two types of questions. First is the problem solving and the second is the data sufficiency. Problem solving questions. Problem solving questions are actually standardized multiple choice questions. You'll get a question statement which will be followed by five option choices out of which one is going to be correct. You're going to mark it and move ahead. Next is data sufficiency questions. These are quite unique to GMAT. You will be given a question prompt which will carry some insufficient data. The question statement would be followed by two option statements which will carry some data relevant to the question statement. And our job is to tell whether the data given in the options are sufficient or not. There would be five options which are always kept in the same order. So it is recommended that you learn the order. Option choice A says, statement 1 alone is sufficient to answer the question, but statement 2 alone is not sufficient. Option choice B says, statement 2 alone is sufficient, but statement 1 alone is not sufficient. Option C says, both statements together are sufficient to answer the question, but neither alone is sufficient. Option choice D says, each statement alone is sufficient to answer the question. Option choice E says, statement 1 and 2 together are not sufficient. So these were the question types. Let's quickly move on to the problem solving tips and some tricks. The first one is back solving. Now you must be thinking that we already know it. But do you know the correct way of back solving? Or are you trying all the five options to get to the correct answer? If you are doing so, you are wasting a lot of time. So let us understand what is back solving and what is the effective way of utilizing this technique. It is one of the most important and effective technique but only if it is carried out correctly. What is the meaning of it? Simply use the answer choices and place them back in the question. If the scenario and the condition matches, your answer is correct. If not, then your answer is definitely wrong. Go ahead and choose the next option. But are we going to do it for the five options? Is it the correct way? You know, it's a lot time consuming. So what is the correct way? I'll first explain you the correct way, then I'll try to explain it with an example. Arrange the option choices in ascending or descending order. Start with the central value. So if your answer comes out to be a little less or a little more, accordingly you can discard the two options as well and you are just left with the two quantities. Then try the second one. If it fits, the answer is correct. If it not, then the remaining one is the answer. So even in the worst scenario, you are able to get to the answer just by checking two values. If it is clear, then it is good. Otherwise, let's go with an example and try to understand it better. Just read this question quickly. So John needs to buy a ticket to attend the conference for work. His own department contributes $4 less than half the price. The HR department will contribute $1 more than a third of the price of the ticket. With these two contributions, Harold has to pay only $10. Alright, and we need to find out the price of the ticket. So here are the five options. Let's quickly arrange them in ascending or descending order. So after doing the first step, I have these following values. 36, 42, 48, 54, and 60. So I'll try out with 48 first of all. And if in this scenario, Herod has to pay more than 10, that means definitely the price of the ticket was either 36 or 42. That is less than 48. But if Herod has to pay less than $10, then the price of the ticket is certainly more than 48. So I'll be able to discard two more options if my 48 is not correct. So second step, let us fix the 48. So, price ticket $48, alright, the next thing what I have is, department contributes 4 less than half the price, so half of 48 is 24, 
minus 4, so department is given 20. HR department $1, more than one third. So one third of 48 is 16 and a one, that's $17. So the total contribution is 37 and 48 is the ticket. When I subtract 48 minus 37, I get $11. And in the question it is given to me that Harold has paid $10. That means the price of the ticket is definitely less than 48. So automatically the option 60 and the option 54 are gone with 48. So in the worst scenario also I'm just left with two options. That's why it is better to start with the central option. Now, even though I can make out that the answer now is 42 because 48 just have one dollar extra and I need all to pay ten dollar so it should be slightly less not a lot less right let's try and be sure about it so I'm gonna try 42 so ticket value 42 his department for less than the half price so 21 minus 4 is 17 HR department again one dollar more than a third of the price 14 plus 1 that's 15 so the total contribution is 17 plus 15, that's 32. And Harold has to pay 42 minus 32, that's $10. And that matches the scenario. So the answer is A in just two applications of the answer choices. If the answer would not have matched, I would have directly gone to the 36 and marked it correct. So even in the worst scenario, I was there with just two values. So if you are till here, so you're going to go ahead and you definitely learn some more tricks. Let's continue. So it's the tip two. Recognizing the factor of answers. Now it is one of the most important and effective technique in the brutal topics such as permutation and combinations and algebra questions. Let us understand what do you mean by recognizing the factors of the answers and how it can be helpful. So if you're able to recognize the factor of an answer somehow, you'll be able to eliminate various options and it will most oftenly happen in PNC. Let's try to understand with an example. Suppose you had a question like this. It says a five digit odd number says that it carries exactly eight one times, it carries one two at some place and he asks you how many such numbers are possible if the number carries no digit zero and you have these five options. Now they may be tricky sometimes and we're not able to do them. So how to get these questions correct within no time? Just recognize one factor by recognizing the conditions. So let us note the conditions over here. We have three important conditions. That's it's a five digit number. It is exactly one time and it carries one to some place. And of course there is no zero. So four things which I have. So the easiest one for me is that the number is odd, which it says over here. So definitely the last digit has to be placed by five options. So the answer would something look like 5xyz and so on. There will be definitely a factor of 5 in your answer. So what is this 268 doing here? Or what is this 184 or 343 doing over here? They are definitely not the answer. You can eliminate them. So what you are left with is just 270 and 250. Further, if you recognize that the other two conditions are 8 1 times and it carries 1 2 at a certain place, so 1 digit would be fulfilled by 8, 2 digits would be carried by 1 2 with some of the other condition, I don't care right now, and the last digit is odd. So I'm done with the 4 digits, 8, odd, and 1 2. Still, you're left with the 5th digit, which definitely does not carry a 0. So there will be 9 options for that. So I can say that the answer will also have a factor of 9 definitely it will be something kind 9xyz. So we were already left with just 250 and 270 where 250 is not the multiple of 9. So it is also gone. So the only answer left over here is option choice B 270 which is a multiple of 9 as well as 5. And there you go. A difficult a brutal question just cracked straight away. PNC a difficult topic for most of us and these things are gonna work. Alright guys, hope you're enjoying it. Let's continue with some more cool tricks. Tip 3. Dimensions and like-unlike terms. This especially can be used in word problems. It is one of the most important and effective technique which you can use in word problems when GMAT induces variables instead of numbers. 
Guys, whenever you have numbers, it's quite easy. I say 20 km, 10 km per hour, you directly say 2 hours to me. But when it is X, Y, Z, our mind fumbles. We do not know what to do ahead, what to assume, how to go ahead. Let's see a trick for that. Guys, you cannot add or subtract unlike terms. First thing, if I ask you, add 2 hours to 6 km per hour, what is going to be your answer? You will say simply that you cannot add this stuff, alright? Only like terms can be added or subtracted, we are going to use it, first thing. Second thing, the dimension of the answer must match the dimensions of the quantity asked in the question. Suppose if I am asking you the distance from your home to work, you are going to give me some answer in kilometers, miles or meters. You won't say it's 44 km per hour, that is simply useless, right? So the dimension also must match the answer choice. Now let us see the question and understand it further. Here is the question. Bob bikes to school with a speed of x km per hour. Alright, I can keep a note over this x km per hour. On a certain day his bike got flat tire exactly halfway. He immediately started walking with a speed of y km per hour. So another speed mentioned over here, that's y. Find the distance between his home to school if he took time t on the certain day. So things to note over here, I have x and y that are the speeds and t is the time. So we need to notice the variables first of all. Now guys, you know that speed and time cannot be added. So what is this option C and D doing here? You cannot add 4 km per hour to 3 hours or a certain speed to a time. So what is option C and D are doing over here? This is adding a speed to the time. This is also adding a speed to the time. They are useless options. You can just go ahead and eliminate them. And definitely you'll be able to eliminate one or two options as soon as he induces some variables. Similarly, you can apply it in work rate and time. These are gone straight away. You're just left with A, B and E. These tricks are also useful when you're left with very less time and you want to mark a guess. Right? Let's go ahead and eliminate the further options. Now I'm left with A, B and E. C and E are totally gone. Now guys, the second thing which I talked about was the dimension. You are looking for the distance between his home to school. So definitely it's going to be some distance. Uh, let's try to find out the dimensions of each of the options. Option choice A says x plus y upon xy which is a speed plus speed over speed into speed. So in the numerator I'll have a speed and the denominator I'll have a speed square. So it's definitely going to be 1 by speed. Is it the dimension of distance? Definitely no. So this option is not valid at all. It does not even give you a distance. What about the option B? It's quite similar to A, just the reciprocal of it, with a negative sign, of course. So it's speed square upon speed plus speed or speed minus speed, does not matter. It can be just a speed, right? So this is also not the answer choice. So eliminate this also. I'm just left with E now. What does E say? 2xyt upon x plus y, that's a speed into speed into time upon speed plus speed. So a speed into speed into time by a speed. One speed gets cancelled and you're left with a speed into time, that's definitely a distance. So here is only one option which actually represents a distance and is not creating any foolish terms like adding speed to time. There you are guys. And the answer is option choice E without even solving, without even understanding the scenario. So I hope you like all this cool stuff. There are a lot more coming up. You can like and subscribe and let us know what are you exactly looking for. Till now, we have talked about the problem solving tricks only. The later videos are going to comprise the data sufficiency tricks and you can subscribe the channel so you do not miss those. A lot of cool stuff coming on guys, better to subscribe it.